video four of chapter eight, we're going to focus on um, a certain aspect of confidence intervals in this video where the big question is, what sample size are we going to need to carry out the confidence interval? So sometimes after taking a random sample and we take our sample proportion, we take our p hat and we calculate the confidence interval, all of a sudden we discover that the margin of error is more, is higher, is larger than we expected it to be. So is there a way that we can control the size of the margin of error before we even take our random sample? And the answer is yes, we can certainly do that. There's a couple ways, but there's really one major way that we're going to do that. Now, remember, the margin of error is the part in our formula that's after the plus or minus. We have our point estimate, which is our statistic, which is going to be typically our sample proportion p hat, plus or minus, and then all the rest of the stuff. This told us how many standard deviations we want to deviate from our point estimate. Now, we can control the critical value by changing the confidence level, right? We can be less confident. The more confident we were, the more standard deviations we could go out. And the more standard deviations we go out, then the wider our confidence interval was. So if we're like, well, if our margin of error is too large, then we're going out too many standard deviations. So let's not go out as many standard deviations. Let's shrink the critical value. But if we shrink our critical value, then we are shrinking our confidence level, and we may not necessarily want to be less confident. So is there a way that we can adjust the margin of error while still maintaining the same confidence level or the same critical value? And there absolutely is. And it focuses on really the only thing, the only other thing that we can control in a confidence interval, and that is the sample size. So if you remember, we talked about this in our sampling distribution chapter, where if we increased our sample size, well, then that made the standard deviation or the standard error value decrease. And if the standard deviation, if this giant square root part, if this overall is a smaller, smaller value, then that would mean once we take a smaller value times the critical value, well, then our margin of error overall would be smaller as well. So remember, when we increase that sample size, we're making the denominator of a fraction bigger, which overall makes the fraction smaller. And then this also worked in the opposite way, that if we decreased our sample size, well, then that really increased our standard deviation or our standard error. But that's the direction we don't want to go in. We don't want to make our margin of error larger. We want to make it smaller. So now we're going to talk about, well, how big of a sample size do we need? So it all depends on what we want or need the margin of error to really not exceed. And what I mean by that is an example like this. Political polls often seek to not exceed a 3% margin of error. So oftentimes, especially near um, election time, they'll say, we took a poll and, you know, this percent of people wanted to vote for this candidate and this percentage for this candidate. And then usually down at the bottom in very fine print, it'll say the margin of error was plus or minus 3%. They don't want to be more than 3% off in either direction with a certain level of confidence, typically 95%. So if we want the margin of error to not be any bigger than 3%, and we want to maintain 95% confidence, well then what sample size are we going to need to achieve that? Really what we're going to say is what is the minimum sample size we need to achieve that? So again, since we're talking about the margin of error out of that whole formula for the confidence interval, again, we're only focusing on the part after the plus or minus. So the margin of error, the ME, is equal to the part after the plus or minus. So the critical value times the standard error of the statistic or the standard deviation. So if we want our margin of error to really not exceed a certain value, we could say we want this margin of error to be greater than or equal to whatever this value needs to be for the margin of error. And so we said, let's let the margin of error not exceed 3%. 
So we want this 3% to be the greatest that this actual margin of error will achieve so that it won't be any bigger. It's always going to be smaller than or equal to 3%. Now, for our critical value, since we said we were using 95% confidence, then if I use inverse norm of one tail area, 2.5%, then that would give me my 1.96 critical value. Now, if I have 3% margin of error is going to be the greatest that it will be, with a critical value of 1.96, and then I've got my standard deviation, I still need to plug in a value for the sample proportion, for p hat. But what is p hat if I haven't taken the sample, right? I get p hat from the sample, but I haven't taken the sample yet. So here's where we're going to kind of play around with some values. We're going to figure out there is a particular value for p hat that will maximize our sample size. So I'm going to start towards the upper end. And I could have started at, let's say, 0.1. But you'll see a pattern emerge, regardless of which number I really start with here. So what if I let p hat be 90%? And so now I'm only going to solve this once. And then we're going to change the value of p hat. And then I'll just tell you what the answer comes out to be, because it's all going to be solved in a very similar manner. So if I wanted to now solve for the sample size n, well, first thing I would need to do is I would need to divide both sides by the critical value. So if I divided my margin of error by my critical value, then I would have this value. And I'm, I'm not going to simplify these into a new value. I'm just going to leave it the way that it is because it'll just make the math a little bit easier. So once I've done that, now this is gone over here. And then to get to that end, well, now I need to break open this square root, right? So now I would take both sides and I would square both sides to get rid of the giant square root over here. So now that's gone. And then, do, 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 let me just rewrite this down here. Bum, bum, bum. And then we've got 0.9 and then 1 minus 0.9 divided by n. Well, then what I can do, I need to get the n out of the denominator. So I can multiply both sides by n so that it cancels out over here. So now imagine, do, 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 do. I've got this. And then I want to get rid of this thing that is being multiplied within. So I would divide it over. So if I did this and I divided this whole quantity over to the other side. Basically, n and this giant fraction squared are just trading places. So n has to be greater than or equal to this crazy looking fraction, right? Now, this is where people definitely want to take their time and carefully type this into their calculator, but I will already share with you what all that comes out to be. And so n will end up being greater than or equal to 384.16 as our sample size. Now, initially I said, well, what if p was 0.9? But couldn't p hat be some other number besides 0.9? So what if I decreased it a tenth? What if p hat was 0.8? Then what's the sample size? Oh, now the sample size is even bigger right? When it was 0.9, we had 384, 385, and now we're at 683, technically. I mean, we, we would call that decimal person a person, right? Person's a person, no matter how small they are. So now I increase my sample size by like 300, just by altering p hat by one tenth. Well, what happens if I decrease p hat by another tenth to 0.7? Well, then... The jump isn't as extreme, but it still goes up. It's 897 now instead of 683. Well, what if p hat was 0.6? Oh my gosh, now we're over at over 1,000 we need for our sample size. Well, what if p hat was 0.5? Well, it went up even more, right? But really not as much as it did previously, right? It seems like it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller, those increases, as we decrease by uh, one-tenth each time. And so now what if p hat was 0.4? Oh my gosh, how much bigger is it going to get now? What? Wait a second, it actually went back down. And that number looks awfully familiar, doesn't it? That was the same exact number when p hat was 0.6. Well, that's interesting. 
when p hat was 0.6 and when p hat was 0.4, we get the same number? How can that be? And it's really all in the standard deviation formula. Remember right here, here's where I said, let's let p hat be 0.4. Well, how much is this value? What's one minus 0.4? It's 0.6. Let me jump back to when p hat was 0 0.6. Well, then how much is this 1 minus 0 0.6 value? It's 0.4. And so does it matter which way we multiply two numbers? No. This is 0 0.6 times 0.4, and then this is 0 0.4 times 0 0.6. So really, it's the same exact equation. It's just slightly rewritten differently. So in the end, when we looked at all of our various values of p hat, we noticed that when we got to 0.5, that really maximized our sample size, or it said the sample size had to be at least this size in order to achieve uh, that certain margin of error with that certain confidence level. Now, the pattern we noticed here was that when we got to 0.6 and 0.4, that those were really the same, and 0.7 would be the same as 0.3. 0.2 would be the same as 0.8, and 0.1 would be the same as 0.9. So we see that symmetry happening. So really that 0.5, it's, it's in the middle of all that symmetry. And that's where we're going to get our largest sample size. Now the one other thing to consider here is whatever decimal value that you would get from your calculation, you're always going to round that number up to the next person or the next thing. And the reason is if, for example, let's say I rounded this down, because you might be like, well, 0.111, that would round down to 1067, right? I wouldn't use 1068, but what would happen is if you plugged in 1067 in for the sample size, what you would get for a margin of error is a number that is slightly larger than 3%. And remember, we weren't trying to exceed 3%. So if we make our sample size go up that one, then we will not exceed the 3% margin of error. So always take that decimal value, regardless of what value it is. It could be 0 0.01, and you would still technically bump it up. Again, always consider a person's a person, no matter how small that they are. So when solving for a sample size, to achieve a certain margin of error with a certain confidence level, always use p hat to be 0.5 to maximize that sample size. The only other time you would not use 0.5 would be if the problem gives you a specific value for p hat based on previous results or previous studies. They may say previously another study was done and they found this result. Then it's fair game to be able to use that number because maybe it's still very similar to what it was previously. Or, you know, best case scenario, you just say, well, I'm just going to use 0.5 because 0.5 is always going to make the sample size as big as it possibly needs to be able to achieve that certain margin of error. So what I want you to do is to try this problem. You're gonna solve this algebraically twice. So studies have found that 73% of people can roll their tongues. Using a p hat value of 0.73, I want you to calculate the minimum sample size needed to have a margin of error of no more than 4% with 94% confidence. Then redo your calculation, but use that maximum value of 0.5 for p hat, and then calculate what would be the minimum sample size you would need to still have a margin of error of no more than 4% with 94% confidence. And we will go over these together in class tomorrow.